Hi, my name is Jan Wilczek from dwolfsound.com. Welcome to Wolf Talk, a podcast about audio programming. In this podcast, you will learn how to build your career in programming or research related to audio, meet programmers and researchers from all around the world, and learn about the intricacies of sound. Hi everyone, this is Jan Wilczek from dwolfsound.com and welcome to the sixth episode of the Wolf Talk podcast. Today I'm very excited to introduce to you a colleague of mine, Moritz Schaller from Dresden in Germany and we work together in Loudly GmbH in Berlin. And Moritz is special in that sense that he's a professional musician who turned audio programmer. I don't want to spoil his story, but I know that among those of you listening, there are a lot of musicians who are considering whether to change their career paths or not. And I hope that Moritz will be able to provide you with some inspiration and some tips in that regard. And if you consider becoming an audio programmer and you're not sure where to start or what you need to learn, I have a resource just for you. It's my ultimate audio plugin developer checklist. It's a checklist that lists every bit of knowledge that is needed to become an audio programmer. And you can get it for free under dwoofsound.com slash checklist. Once again, dwoofsound.com slash checklist, ultimate audio plugin developer checklist. And now I just want to tell you that the episode notes, so all the people, places, and things mentioned in this podcast episode can be found under dewolfsound.com slash talk 006. And now let's begin. Hi, Moritz. I'm very happy to have you on the podcast. Thanks for agreeing on this interview. Could you introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, indeed I can. Hi, uh, I'm Moritz Schaller. I am a musician by trade and I recently uh, switched to another career path and became a software engineer, which is uh, how I met Jan because we were working at the same company together. It's a uh, audio music tech startup. Yeah. And I think uh, Jan was very interested in uh, letting me share my, my story here. So I'm happy to be sharing something. Yeah, exactly. I must say that I find your story very inspiring. I don't want to give too much away at this moment, but I think your story uh, will also be inspiring for a lot of other people. Uh, especially musicians who are considering transitioning to a new career. And well, I know that there are a lot of, a lot of musicians who want, would like to get into audio development. So you mentioned that you are a musician by training and uh, that's something that I wanted to ask you. So at the very beginning, uh, how did you develop this interest in playing a musical instrument? <laughs> um, so uh, I've been playing music for as long as I can remember, basically. Um, I, I, was, I had the, the luck of and the privilege of being born into a family with uh, arts all around. My mother uh, studied music herself, then became an actress. My father is uh, an author. And so they... they uh, saw to it that uh, I, I got lessons on the piano really early. I started playing the piano when uh, I was six, I guess, like right when I started school. Awesome. Uh, actually, actually, that's that's uh, exactly as, as me. So like I also started at six. <laughs> that's uh, cool. That's I, I didn't know that. Yeah. And how did it develop from there? Uh, yeah, basically, I I was partly interested in it, and and I kept like practicing every day a bit, also because just routine and um, uh, and and also other people like, like telling me, hey, please go practice your one hour per day uh, because that's just what you have to do, and I accepted that back back then uh, until about I think. 10th grade when when I was really fed up with it uh, and I said I want to stop 
And that was, I think that was the moment when I really took it into my own hands. Um, and after that, I, I probably uh, didn't touch the piano for half a year. And then I started, mm, maybe, maybe I could. And I started improvising a bit before I had classical training. Um, yeah, and I started improvising and then I heard some, some tune, I don't know what, uh, with a saxophone in it. And I had this idea, yeah, maybe I should learn the saxophone. And so I did, yeah. <laughs> awesome. And uh, do you know maybe if uh, someone uh, wants to play saxophone? Because as if I remember well, like you cannot play saxophone when you are very young, right? Like because because of the lungs, right? The lungs are not developed. Is it correct? Yeah, there's multiple things. You just have to be big enough to hold the instrument because yeah, that's true. That's it's true. kind of large and um, and heavy. Uh, I'm not sure about the lungs, to be honest. I should know because I <laughs> actually have a permit to teach. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't. Don't know from the top of my head. So okay, so I would think that that maybe if like little children cannot play saxophone but want to then maybe they can also start with the piano but definitely it's a great great background and then uh, was it then that you started learning saxophone yeah that was uh, like at how old was it in like 16 17 maybe so quite late actually um and but i i really enjoyed it and i decided to do it myself uh I, i myself decided that i want to do it mm -hmm. and uh, i uh quickly got to meet some people from the from the uh, music college and uh, yeah basically was had a, a teacher who was also a student at the college and yeah so that was worked out very well for me but at the same time i was uh, mainly Uh, aiming to become a scientist, actually, because I was on a I was on a special school for mathematics and science, uh, and then I went to study physics. That's what I started out with, and I just did the saxophone thing on the side. But then I, I kind of uh, yeah I, I was very heartbroken at some uh, time in my life and uh, had to rethink everything basically. Uh, which is when I decided I don't want to become a physicist, I want to become a musician. I didn't finish the physics thing uh, and yeah, went, went to Berlin to, um, to train for the entrance examinations for, the, for studying music that I did for two years. And that was an awesome time because I uh, basically spent all day with other people who also wanted to become musicians mm -hmm. and was learning all the time. And yeah, and then I got accepted. Uh, Uh, to Leipzig uh, Music College, which is one of the three, uh, well, I'd say most desirable places to study music here in Germany, which is Berlin, Cologne and, and Leipzig. Yeah, and that is uh, where I really noticed, hey, I am really late to the party. <laughs> Other people um, have been doing this for many more years than me and I had to um yeah to either do a lot of work and uh, and get get to the same level or find other ways to excel and yeah <laughs> so which path did you choose i think i took a middle path oh, okay <laughs> like, like for, for me um, in science if you want to get good at it you have to be very good at understanding stuff and i definitely am very good at quickly Uh, understanding things but in music there's just you have to uh, to do the work you have to do the wood chopping um, and I got better at the wood chopping part like practicing your scales and, and doing it every day um, but I definitely always took the, the shorter routes if possible so I was always optimizing my ways to practice and yeah so that, that never really got uh, completely um, solved for me. And also, I mean, um, like there's, uh, there's other musicians who are uh, like way more uh, capable on their instruments than me, um, obviously. But that's, I guess that's something that you always have as a musician. There's always someone who's younger and better and... Uh. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's. Uh, I think. Uh, I I don't remember who said it, but they said basically that if you compare to others yourself to others, you you'll either be uh, bitter or vain, because there are always people who are better than you and always people that are, that are that are worse than you, basically in in some some part. But then uh, I think the author the author of the Dilbert comics. So he said that he's he's not a great comedian. He's not a great uh, artist in, in in drawing, but uh, but he can combine these skills to create something unique. And I think that's something that that you did. So uh, you already traveled quite far because you come from Dresden, right? Then you went to Ber Berlin for one year, and then you went to Leipzig, and then there you studied for five years, is it correct? Uh, I think all in all, I kind of studied for six years on my bachelor's, uh, and but that involved uh, like four years studying there and then um, moving to Berlin already, oh, okay. and, uh, and, and pushing my, my exams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I get it. I, get it. Uh, I, I think you're not the the only one that does this. <laughs> no. No. That was the standard operating procedure uh, uh, in this place. That you wanted to stay in the in the um, HMT Leipzig, the the school, for as long as you can, because that's how long you can actually uh, go there, get a room to rehearse or to practice, or so. So there's a lot of. Um, uh, benefits from that, from from still being a student. Yeah, know. that's that's true. That's true. Also, in the research world, you get access to uh, a lot of online journals <laughs> and the library, <laughs> which after after graduating you don't anymore. <laughs> That's what I have to learn uh, now the hard way, really, because uh, in, in my work at Loudly now, I sometimes have to look up uh, research papers and often I find uh, there's a paywall. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Sign, with, sign in with your uh, institution account, institutional account. Okay, so now you, st you completed the, the music studies and... Mm -hmm. Like, what was your next step from there? Okay, so my next step was I obviously I uh, I was studying jazz music, so there was really not a lot of opportunity to to actually get employment uh, as a, like a, um, to not be self-employed, but really you have to work freelance, and that's what I did. So I. Uh, did some playing. I did some uh, writing music for theater plays. Uh, I did music production. And uh, but still, like the music industry is really—it's uh, crazy how little money is in there. And now that I am in the IT world, I have another new perspective on how little money that actually is that is in that business. Um, so yeah, so I had a, a day job um, at a, a like part time at a, a music retailer where they would uh, uh, like sell equipment and instruments and everything. And I was um, yeah in in the office. And uh, if there's a new cable, I would make pictures and put them online so that people can buy it and stuff like this. So it was a very boring day job, uh, really. And I got kind of depressed. Uh, doing it and then then the pandemic came around and I was like okay now definitely the, the the music thing is not gonna bring any money in so I have to look for other opportunities and remember other stuff that I know uh, yeah so so that's how I kind of then got the idea of hey maybe I should uh, explore all the other stuff that I've been learning along the years but by, by the way um, I mean I stopped studying physics uh, but that obviously did not mean that I stopped being interested in anything technology related. So I, I was uh, like while studying music, for example, I was the guy who recorded everybody. So I had lots of microphones and recording equipment, um, did lots of research in you know, how does digital audio actually work? How do all the different audio effects uh, work? 
and yeah so so naturally that led to me scraping all the different audio related fields along the way okay and so it was yeah, also uh, uh, i had the idea maybe i can do uh, make money with this somehow and uh, before you graduated uh, have like had you already learned some programming language maybe before you finished the, the music uh, college not not really i uh, i actually learned some uh, super basic stuff uh, in school in informatics class um, we uh, believe it or not we learned some c++ <laughs> yeah i believe you i believe you <laughs> Uh, like, like that, but super basic things um, like variables, functions, or stuff that you would know from from math class. Uh, yeah. So, but but never. I hated it back then. I really did not enjoy it at all because it was tedious and it was hey, this is uh, x one plus x two is so it, not useful to me in any way. Uh, and while I was studying music, no, I did not do any programming. While while doing the this super boring um, office job, I did learn. I think that's where I really learned programming because uh, then the pandemic came and I was in my home office, and I noticed, hey, these tasks that I'm doing, they are really repetitive. So they really would lend themselves to automating them. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's when I started exploring Python uh, a little more. Um, and I started writing like little little tools that would like crop images and upload them to an FTP server or like read large Excel files and compare prices and, and things like that. Yeah, that, that, that reminds me that, that there is a book, actually. I haven't read it, so it's not a recommendation. recommendation. It's not an official Wolfson recommendation. Please bear this in mind. But there's a book which is called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. And I think that's a perfect example of, of what you did, exactly. Exactly, yeah. So, the funny thing yeah. is my colleagues did not know that I was doing this uh, because I kind of kept it secret. Uh, and, and some stuff that would usually people would, would take half a day doing something i would do it in uh, like half half an hour <laughs> um, nice. and, and then keep learning about programming um and then when i when i left the company i gave them all these tools <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah that was that was a fun experience actually yes because it was really something useful it was using programming as a tool rather than as a um, uh, means in itself Nice. Um, so you actually, with these skills, did you manage to find a programmer's job after then? So was it like kind of this transition that led you into this world? Like partly, um, I mean, that that's kind of how I learned Python, but I obviously had some... Uh, like I had some dealings with other languages as well. Uh, at some point I was uh, thinking, hey, maybe I can work in the games industry. And, and uh, I was very interest, uh, interested in uh, all these music systems for games and adaptive music. So I learned how to use uh, all these audio middleware, things like WeWise and FMOD, uh, Unity, obviously also some basic stuff and um, uh, C sharp to to deal with that. Um, I then uh, one thing I did I did a project for the um, Bauhaus festival a few years back, where we did an arts installation. I did this with uh, two other people uh, who I knew from theater projects, and there I built something in uh, Max Max mm -hmm. XP, uh, and. With that, I kind of, oh, I kind of noticed. Yeah, I, I don't really enjoy the the music part of it. I mean, I, I did enjoy making the music, but mostly I enjoyed programming the thing and, and making it do stuff that 
uh, making it react to, for example, we had um, motion trackers in a puppet and people would move the puppet and then the, the audio would change depending on the movement. So that was super fun and also super fun to see how people interact with this. And uh, that, uh, yeah, again, programming, uh, not uh, because, hey, it's super cool to be a programmer, but because it solves a specific problem. Um, yeah, so that was, I think that was what really inspired me to think, hey, maybe this is actually fun. I should, uh, I should do this for a living because, uh, hey, I don't want to do things that are super boring and just taking up my time. Uh, yeah. yeah, and That's uh, how, I, how I decided I want to become a programmer. Cool. So we also discovered that programming can be used for Art. art. I mean, now that I think about it, like most of audio programming is basically programming that is related to art. art. But I think what you did, like, is is even more involved because, because it it's it's programming that, that interacts with people in an artistic way, way. so to say. So you can that's actually very very beautiful. Creative coding, although that is also a very specific yeah. field, I think. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So then uh, your adventure started to find a programmer's job maybe maybe yeah um i actually i was not uh um or actually yes i did uh, uh i did uh, apply for jobs that had some programming i i for example applied at native instruments uh, uh because i thought yeah pff, uh, qa automation that's something i can do and uh, they never or are they replied half a year later yeah oh, we just found your application it looks very nice but the position is <laughs> uh, already taken months ago um yeah and then then i kind of thought yeah maybe i'm just not not at that point yet and i applied um at loudly just out of the blue basically i saw it on linkedin i think um and i applied as a music producer <laughs> Oh, and uh, because I thought, yeah, that's what I can do, and it was also the time when I thought, uh, yeah, um, producing music for games is cool and everything. Um, so I, I did this, and I kind of wrote in my CV, like at the very bottom, I had something about being able to uh, write Python code, uh, and of course, like at the top, it said also something about physics. Uh, so I guess that also has been uh, one thing. Uh, yeah, and they, they didn't give me the job. <laughs> so uh, that was a failure too. And then it was, I think, five weeks later or something that uh, the CEO called me and said, yeah, we maybe have another role uh, which would be more development related. Would you be willing uh, to do that? And I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and that's uh, how, I, how I got in. Basically, I did a small programming test, which was I felt was quite easy. Um, it also helped that uh, our team leader uh, studied physics as well at the same university, so he kind of knew what what I what kind of background I had. And um, also, the idea behind this position was that I mean, in the company we have um, we have programmers and we have uh, producers. And they kind of needed someone in between who can bridge that gap. And that, I think, was uh, what I was supposed to be. So at this point, I think it's worth a little bit explaining what Loudly is about. So Loudly is a company that uh, Moritz and me work at. And it's a primarily company that deals with music technology, as many other companies in Berlin. I think what makes Loudly a little bit unique is that it has a few products that are, I would say, completely different from each other uh, and also serve completely different audiences. They are, they are all related to music and also somehow, which is, which is incredible, they, are, they interact with each other very well. So for example, I work as an audio developer uh, in the Music Maker Jam team. And Music Maker Jam is an application for mm, Windows, Android, and iOS. And it is a kind of um, loop-based 
digital audio workstation, you could say, or a sequencer. Um, I think there are a lot of different names that we could call this, but basically uh, it's an app that you can download from, from the mobile stores, which I, I, by the way, I encourage you to do. And uh, there you can choose from, I mean, hundreds of thousands of pre-made high quality loops that you can compose into your original compositions. And the other, I, I would say a big, uh, big product is Soundtracks, which is um, a, a, an application that allows you to pick and adjust music to your video without installing any software on your computer. So you can do it all in your browser and you can also adjust the music and, and in the parts that you want it to. And there's also a, a mobile application. So with this background, where, uh, where did you come uh, in, so to say? How, um, how does your role fit this ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's funny that you say the word ecosystem because it really is. And for me, uh, it took quite some time uh, to actually understand the interaction between all the things that are happening. Um, because uh, the, the Music Maker Jam is really the, the engine of all of this. Um, and uh, yeah, but maybe I digress. Uh, maybe I get back to the, the question really, because what, what is, was I doing? So uh, we have mainly this, this huge amount of loops and really it is hundreds of thousands of loops uh, of, of pre-produced um, pre music when they contain usually just one instrument. Uh, and when I started, we had a data scientist in the team and he just left when I was starting. So naturally, I was tasked with learning everything about the data science part that he was doing. And at the time, we were doing um, uh, yeah, some research about uh, feature extraction. Um, uh, yeah, it's hard, hard to, to decide where to start with this. So, so we have all the loops. We have the Music Maker Jam engine, which is combining loops to make music. Then we have the soundtracks library, which is library music uh, page that allows you to um, upload these videos and do these things. Uh, and the idea was, hey, can we have an automatic music generator that takes all the loops from these pool from this this pool and recombines them to form new music that can then be uh, rendered from uh, through the MMJ through the Music Maker Jam engine and then uploaded as content on the music library. So that is the idea, and we had uh, or we have a team working uh, on um, on an AI that does this. And um, the data scientist that uh, I was learning from, uh, he was in, in charge of extracting features from the audio for the AI to use. Uh, so that's what I started uh, out with. And I was then building an automated pipeline uh, at first. So at first I spent quite some time like just researching about the feature set and how can we improve the feature set. Um, so there was some, some DSP and some uh, learning about um, machine learning. And then um, I automated this process so that every time our producers produce new material, we just click a button and it, it does all the extraction itself and puts the data where it needs to go. Uh, yeah, so there was again the automation part. Um, yeah, and then we decided, yeah, the AI gives quite cool results but it's sometimes, uh, it's kind of skewed. It has some things that it does really well, some things that are uh, uh, worth improving. And so we thought, hey, maybe we can add more of a rule-based approach. So then I was uh, soon tasked with uh, writing a rule-based um, music generator. And that turned out like, uh, 
really, really well. I, I um, had a close collaboration with one of our music producers who was very tech savvy. Uh, and he, he basically gave me, yeah, what if the algorithm could do this and that? And then I would implement these algorithms. And over time, it grew into a pretty large application um, that now generates music based on rules um, and some metadata. And, and other features that I extract from the audio itself. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of a, so we have the rule-based thing and the, and the AI machine learning based thing to generate music. Okay, so, so to recap this, the general idea was where we have the users, uh, hundreds of thousands of users that are, that are using Music Maker Jam to make music, where they choose the particular loops, then they combine them into parts, and they generate whole songs. Mm, and we also have this soundtrack system with obviously needs a huge catalog of high quality music. And we also had a huge catalog of high quality loops produced by our internal producers. So the idea was how could we replace the user with an automated system so that we could generate a large number of high quality songs and by high quality I not I not only mean technical quality so there is no crackles or something but uh, that uh, that people who listen to this automatically generated music they cannot tell that it was actually generated by an artificial intelligence or a rule based system which is uh, I guess a subset of of AI so then with this automated system, we could generate right a lot of, a lot of uh, music, music that uh, could be then used in the soundtracks Tracks. catalog. After, of course, being approved by the music producer, producers also tweaked and so on. on. So it, it, it's also uh, uh, of, uh, how do you say, it? it's, it's, it's not like a, straightforward pipeline but it also requires some some curation obviously because yeah. not everything that gets generated can be can be published and uh, well congratulations actually on on such a such a successful uh, first programming programming endeavor and uh, could you maybe share a little bit of uh, the tools that you are using like the i mean programming tools or libraries that you found uh, useful along the way okay yeah maybe uh, it's it's uh, important to say beforehand that when i came to the company uh, i had very little knowledge about all of these tools i was coming there and i i barely used git a little and um, I knew how to, to use Python as a language, but I was not familiar with a uh, lot of the standard library. Um, I was not familiar with many of the commonly used libraries like NumPy and Pandas. Um, so yeah, I was basically shopping for tools all the time. Um, and mainly I tend to use uh, Librosa for most of the um, of the DSP stuff. Some DSP I just implement myself with NumPy because NumPy is obviously much, much faster than uh, writing uh, things in Python, uh, in native Python. Um, I don't use the like the just-in-time compilation uh, things that uh, Python offers, uh, although that has probably uh, sometimes uh, its uses in in audio. Um, what else am I using? Yeah, all the like the the data science related things uh, for plotting, Matplotlib, um, Seaborn. Um, Did you mention pandas already? I think so. Yeah, yeah, pandas. pandas yeah. 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 Okay, and uh, probably. probably. Yeah, scikit-learn mm -hmm. uh, I use sometimes. Um, for example, uh, lately I was working um, with automatic drum transcription. And so I did some matrix decomposition stuff. And uh, yeah, so I just look whatever has it, I, I use it. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, and then, then I also at some point I, I, I had to kind of deliver this this code or make it usable for people so i had to also 
see how do I do that and that then led me down the path of uh, learning how to build an API so I'm using fast API a lot um, to, to uh, provide my work to the producers I use Flask sometimes um, uh, what else I yeah, also li like writing just little desktop um, GUI things with Tkinter. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, did you also mention like which library do you use for uh, uh, machine learning? I mean, you mentioned some, but is there like some of yeah, the yeah. deep learning maybe libraries that you use as well? I mean, I don't use machine learning very often, to be honest, okay. uh, because I'm a very algorithmic thinker um, but I do use TensorFlow from time to time okay, nice. um, although I don't really like the way that it is structured but yeah, <laughs> yeah PyTorch all the way <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I, I, I had very good experience with PyTorch and and I can highly highly recommend it uh, so if you'd like to try it then <laughs> yeah, Go I, I haven't looked into PyTorch uh, a lot but that's definitely on my list, yes. <laughs> okay, so could you maybe tell how does your music background help you in your day-to-day -day programming, programming duties? duties. Hmm. Um, so I, I think what made this uh, music generator project so successful is the, the small feedback loops that we had. So I work very closely with Felipe, one of our producers. And uh, so that means we have to communicate uh, all the time. And since we are both musicians, we just, we have the same vocabulary. Uh, so if he says, yeah, there's, uh, I hear some clashing, it should be uh, Lydian mode, but it's Ionian and it's just not working, then I know what's, what's the problem. Um, or, I think uh, part of, of learning to or becoming a musician is training passive skills. So listening mostly, uh, being able to listen something and identify what is that, what is, uh, and also listening and finding out what is the problem here. Okay, maybe this intonation is off or something is something too low or too high. Uh, what kind of chord is it that is? So, so it's it's a passive skill that is always there and you kind of forget that you learned all this and also that there's been a time where you were not able to uh, listen to something and just write it down, for example. So that is very helpful. The communication part, the listening part, uh, then obviously um, um, looking at data that comes uh, out of some algorithm and interpreting, uh, yeah, what is this? What does this mean in musical terms? Making that connection, very important. Um, just general knowledge about instruments, I guess, knowledge about music theory. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So then also, uh, on the music production side of things, I would imagine that also you then are also well suited to, for example, saying, okay, we have too much bass uh, for some reason in some of the tracks and we need some algorithm to make up for it or to remove it somehow. And then you can also think of, of many different ways how you can tackle this from algorithmic point of view, musical point of view. So that's, that's, that's really awesome. And, and as you said, you're the link between the producers and the programmers because you speak the language of the both worlds. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I read this, um, uh, this term, uh, T-shaped uh, people. Or, uh, so, so there is I-shaped people who, who excel at one thing. And then there's uh, a T-shaped people who also excel at one thing, but they, they also have some really broad knowledge mm -hmm. across multiple, um, multiple areas. And I think I am kind of like this. And, and I've always seen this as a two-edged sword because it means, yeah, I'm not super amazing at that one thing that I am kind of well-skilled at. 
Uh, but I'm also, I have a lot of things that I looked into for some time <laughs> and then uh, yeah, got kind of okay at it, but, but never great. So that's, that's also frustrating because I'm not excelling at these things very much. But uh, what I've discovered along, along, the, yeah. along the years, yeah. and uh, it also draws a little bit back to what we said, that yeah. there are always people better than us, yeah. that it just suffices to be a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit more knowledgeable yeah. than others, others. Uh, to be able to help them oh. and to be able to serve them well. Yeah. And I find proof for this time and time again. Time again. So, so. so don't be frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the takeaway. Um, I, I wanted then to ask you on a related note that um, could you maybe say that what was the big, biggest challenge in coming to the software development world from the art world? Was there something that you would consider like the biggest challenge? A challenge? I think. Um, I think being challenged is the thing that I really like about it. And the kind of challenge has shifted a lot. Um, so so I, I really enjoy sitting in front of a problem and, and having to solve it. And then, then you get more and more tools under your belt, basically, and more and more problems seem like really easy problems to you. And for me, in the beginning, I, I uh, was just really overwhelmed with all the tools like how do i set up a development environment how do i uh, get git to work how do i not um, interfere with other people's work uh, how yeah where do i get my information from um, so that was at first really learning the tools and um, uh, also knowing learning uh, the accepted solutions to to some problems because many problems everybody who is working with software will face them and there are already solutions in the beginning i really started like building stuff that was already there so when we first thought hey we need some sort of api or some sort of button on a web page i was starting to build my own uh uh, my own web server with the sockets library <laughs> today i was like what a waste of time um, so that was the one thing, um, nowadays I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on the programming side of it. Now it's more about architecture, I guess, because the more the project grows, uh, the more, uh, I run into issues with the system getting too rigid. Uh, and uh, so I had to do quite some some work to to yeah to, to not have a lot of work when I need to uh, change something or have a feature request. Uh, I think that has become kind of the the most important thing now, really, because it it really minimizes the amount of work that I have to do. And I just I mean I still just do it part time, and I'm also uh, the um a very small team because it's only me <laughs> uh, it's a luxury and a curse right yes it is it is uh, i can write all the shitty code that i <laughs> but then i have to deal with it myself as well yeah you, you can push to master and then cry that you did that exactly yes yes and i do sometimes <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And uh, I think that leads us to the most important question of this podcast, or probably not just this episode, but all the episodes. Because the question is, if a musician wanted to transition to a programmer's position, what would you recommend they do as a person who's done this successfully? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, I want to give the precaution that obviously this is my story. It worked for me. It does not mean that it automatically works for you. Um, I have a very particular way of learning, which means that if I'm interested in something, I will just go 110% in that direction. And then I will get bored of this and learn something else. Uh, other people are not like that. 
So, so the same strategies that work for me may not work for you. But uh, if you are like me, um, I think it is worth using that energy. Like if you're interested in something, go for it, uh, try it. Um, and don't be afraid, except that you will probably not be as good at programming as someone who uh, has been doing this for years who has been uh, studying computer science, maybe, um, they will have more tools. That's just, and it's fine. I, I, for example, the most important thing for me in this job from a mental point of view was I don't want to be ever ashamed of things that I do not know. Um, uh, and that is something as a musician, I often felt ashamed of the things that I were not able to do on my instrument. Um, so really accept what you can do and what you cannot do and then go on a learning binge. You have to learn a lot of stuff and uh, the best stuff you learn while doing projects, real, real world projects with real world problems that you have to solve because then you, you, you know, programming, I feel like if you go on YouTube and Google for programming tutorials, you get a lot of recipes and you get a lot of uh, yeah these are five uh, programming patterns that you need to know and that's all fine and dandy uh, and these are cool patterns but you don't learn them for the sake of learning the patterns and then telling your friends hey i know five programming patterns um, these are tools you need problems to use them on so i think Find something, find a project and do it and see what is necessary to build it and to give it to somebody uh, to use it. Well, like you just, I'm, I'm writing down because you, you've mentioned like so many important points. <laughs> uh, first of all, like you mentioned that when you find something interesting, you should go 100% for it. Uh, I try not to do this. <laughs> Because I I I, uh, I often I fear that I would be stretched, but like for example, the other day I discovered uh, React React Native. I was like, oh boy, I'm I'm so I I so want to like write an application for whatever just using React Native. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I, I I learned that actually people from the audio industry use it to develop cross-platform apps so it's completely fine according to them uh, but yeah I'm, like every other person i also feel feel the need to do something which is not 100 percent audio programming related but at the same time i also know that uh, mastery requires accepting the boredom you know like if as you said, if you really want to be a great musician, you need to put in the effort. effort. You said chopping wood, but some would call it deliberate practice, which is not always fun, right? And and yeah, but I don't want to diminish your your point here. So um, I think a legitimate interest in something is is a beautiful thing to pursue, and. Uh, I think for for people from with a music background, it can be a great creative stimulus. Actually, mm, then you also mentioned that we need to accept that we're not the best. Uh, we will not be the best in, in what we're doing uh, in the world, mm, which I think is a very good approach. But also, what I noticed. Uh, that a lot of the time gr people who are really good at something like really the best in 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 among their peers they are they are very hard to collaborate with mm -hmm. and maybe because of the ego maybe because of some other other stuff and then in business i feel that i, I mean even even in music like you cannot achieve much when you cannot collaborate with other people because you can only do so much on your own and um, i think when you combine decent skills with great collaboration skills and collaboration skills can be learned then you are set up for success then you also mentioned to do real world projects and I completely agree. I, ju I just wanted to say that I, that I agree because uh, it's, uh, it's I, I, I also fell into this trap of like learning new technology and then, and 
then uh, thinking that okay, I'm I'm getting familiar with this. with this. It was exactly for me the case with Java. I read like a whole book on Java, Java? but the moment I started writing a very simple app in Java, I ran into like problems which were never described in the book actually, actually. and I I needed to somehow deal with them. So and it's completely different different thing. Mm, and maybe the final final point you mentioned that it's not good to learn design patterns, patterns. for just the sake of learning them, and I yeah. totally agree, agree, because design patterns seem abstract when you learn about them, them. without any real coding experience. experience. But for me, it was a little bit ir uh, the other way around. So I had, I had quite a bit of programming experience already. And actually quite late, I started reading, uh, um, so I read this book, this book, Design Patterns, right, by the Gang of Four. four. And for me, it was like an epiphany. So I, I was like, whoa, I, I needed this stuff like one year ago, two years ago. And, and now it's it's all here, like all the problems solved, bam. <laughs> and similar thing was with software, software architecture by Robert C. Martin that you that you all, yeah. uh, you, you also mentioned the architecture thing. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for allowing me to rant a little bit on this. <laughs> but but yeah. you you really mentioned some great points, and I do believe that believe that, that musicians can benefit from from your story and your approach. Do you want to add something to it, maybe? Maybe. Or uh, or is it all? Maybe about the soft skills, because I think you are very right that in, in the business environment, the collaboration is very important. And uh, that's definitely something that I uh, brought from the from the music and also the theater background. Um, because in, in arts, you have to deal with lots of ego. Everybody is bringing their ego to the table and um, Sometimes egos get hurt during rehearsal, you know, somebody makes a remark, somebody's not happy with their playing um, and you have to deal with it. And it's even worse with theater. Uh, so, so you kind of get, get really good. And there's also on top of that really complicated people in arts sometimes. Uh, really um, uh, dysfunctional learners and uh, people who just don't work the same way. <laughs> um, and from that, uh, I think that that kind of puts uh, musicians in a great, uh, um, great situation when you come to a company and you can deal with these people uh, just very easily. And yeah. Um, and by not becoming the best, I don't mean, uh, I meant specifically programming, you know, I mean, you will come to a company and you'll not be the most amazing programmer at the company, but you will be T-shaped. You will have multiple uh, uh, skills and you can bring all that to the table and that will definitely make you, uh, um, yeah, make you stand out. Yeah, not to mention, not to mention your personality, right? Which cannot be, cannot be copied to, to anyone else. Yeah, as you said, uh, this point on, on musician collaboration is, is really cool because that's exactly what Ray Dalio said. So he said that a company is like, uh, I don't know if he named a specific number, but it's basically like, like a group of musicians that uh, are improvising, that are doing a jazz improvisation and it requires exactly managing your ego all the things that you mentioned to produce great music. music. To produce great music. Okay, so now to a little bit uh, chill, more chilled out chilled question, out. <laughs> then because you live and work in Berlin. So mm -hmm. what's your opinion on this? What's your experience of this? Uh, uh, I have a love-hate relationship with the city. I think it's uh, incredibly ugly. Mm -hmm. It is expensive. It is uh, also beautiful in that there are like, like whatever you want to do, whatever kind of music you want to hear or play, you will find people who do the same thing. Or just in general, if you're interested in something, there will be other people here uh, who are interested in the same thing. But you have to find it, and that is the. the it takes work. That is uh, hard. Um, other than that, I think being in a big city uh, is very challenging because you will be uh, in touch with like probably the best people that uh, that are in the field so whatever you do 
uh, in Berlin you will find excellent musicians across the board you will find uh, good programmers um, yeah so so that is I think what's keeping me in the city because otherwise I would probably have gone back to Leipzig or Dresden and just uh, keep working remotely because why not um, but uh, yeah then I, I feel I would not have the, the human interaction that sometimes happen here. Awesome. And exactly the other day we discussed that uh, Berlin is an incredibly flat city, but still there's a huge group apparently of bouldering enthusiasts. So <laughs> this is actually, it is possible to find everyone. <laughs> Mm -hmm. whatever you're interested in thank you thanks a lot thanks a lot for this uh, conversation it was very inspiring also for me at the very end i would like to ask you if someone listening to this is inspired or maybe would like to ask you something or would simply like to contact you where do you recommend they go um that's a good question. You can you can email me, of course. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I think we maybe can put some some links down below. Um, I also have a, a web page that I never update. Um, and uh, don't write me on Instagram because I hate Instagram and I also lost my uh, account somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or on LinkedIn, obviously, yeah, since I'm now uh, part of the new economy. <laughs> awesome. So uh, I will also then write you on, on LinkedIn. <laughs> no, just kidding. And of course, well, I will put all the all the links that uh, you agree on in the uh, description of this whole podcast episode. Moritz, thanks a lot for this conversation. Thank you so much for the bottom of my heart. I'm so happy that we made it happen. And all the best to your future career and all the projects that you take up along the way. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was an amazing talk. Thanks, everyone. That was Moritz Schaller, a musician who turned audio programmer. If you'd like to contact him or look up one of the things that we mentioned during the podcast, please go to the episode notes under dwolfsound.com slash talk006. And if you are considering changing career paths, for example, from music to audio programming, then consider downloading my free audio plugin developer checklist under dwolfsound.com slash checklist. Once again, it's dwolfsound.com slash checklist. And even Moritz himself said that he would have used this research so much back in the day, but you can have access to it right today. Thanks again for listening. And if you have any specific questions, if you found yourself in Moritz's story, then please share your story in the comments on YouTube. And if you found this podcast episode useful, also consider reviewing it on Spotify or whatever other platform that you are listening to it. Thanks again for listening and see you in the next episode. Take care. <laughs>